No one has ever found a program of life or a blueprint in a genome. And we've been looking for over 20 years at complete genome sequences. Thank you very much. It may seem utterly presumptuous for a physiologist, because that's what I am, to enter the hotly disputed philosophical area of free will. So I'll begin by making two bold assertions that I will justify during the talk. The first is that the processes by which living organisms make choices are indeed open to empirical investigation. The relevant questions I will show are empirical, physiological questions as much as they are conceptual, philosophical ones. The second is that these two aspects, the empirical and the conceptual, are necessarily related because we cannot ask, answer, empirical scientific questions in a conceptual vacuum. No science can exist in a conceptual vacuum. So I will not be arguing that physiology alone can answer all the questions independent of philosophy, but I will be arguing the complement to that statement, which is that philosophy alone is also inadequate to the task, and I will clarify these two statements at the end of the presentation. Now, the reason, or one reason, why it is such a hotly disputed area is that to many people it may seem obvious that since organisms are made of and evolved from chemical compounds and systems, they cannot possibly escape from being chemically determined. We don't expect purely chemical processes to be capable of making responsible decisions. That's one of the reasons why we are cautious about approving driverless cars on our streets. The ethical and legal problems depend not on the science, or not on that primarily, but on attributing legal responsibility, whether to the owners of the cars or to the car makers. But in co both cases, you'll notice the ultimate responsibility is attributed to humans, not to that machine. Yet, I'm going to show you in this talk that precisely because of the kinds of chemistry that enable organisms to exist even, let alone behave in the way they do, they cannot be determinate machines. So what exactly are we made of? What is our chemistry? Well, with the exception of a few trace elements, we are largely made of the most common chemical elements in the universe. Hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen, just those four, make up the vast majority of the chemistry of our bodies. Now, of course, they are combined in unimaginably large number of possible ways, because many of the molecules we are made of are polymers, long, Strings of highly variable composition, DNAs, RNAs, and proteins are all long polymers. Threads of sequences of either nucleotides or amino acids. Your DNA and mine consists of strings of nucleotides forming polymers around 3 billion nucleotides long. There wouldn't, incidentally, be enough stuff in the whole universe for all those possible sequences of 3 billion DNA bases even to exist. Now, each of us might be, as I think we are, a highly unique and improbable machine, but we might still be machines determined by our genes and proteins. My demonstration that we cannot be determinant machines begins with just two of those four elements, hydrogen and oxygen. Combined, they make the smallest and the great majority of all the molecules in our bodies, H2O, water. Now, water is an extremely unusual substance in the universe. It is liquid at a range of temperatures way above the maximum temperature at which both of its atoms could be liquids. Oxygen vaporizes at minus 90 centigrade, hydrogen at minus 253. So 
The bonding in H2O is responsible for an enormous increase in the temperature of condensation. There are very few other chemicals that have that property. It is also a very flexible solvent. Nearly all the molecules in our bodies can be dissolved in it. But the exception is extremely important to what I'm going to present as my argument. Fats cannot be dissolved in water. They can exist in a water suspension. Every good cook knows how to make a sauce by whisking up the oil water suspension. But our bodies are rather different from a sauce, thank goodness. The fats in us are actually more like soap bubbles than fat globules. And those bubbles form the vast structures of membranes in our cells and organs. Furthermore, those membranes are where nearly all the control processes, which would be relevant to choice, are to be located. So how on earth did the genome? They're not fats. They're not in the membranes. How on earth did they become described as the book of life, creating us body and mind, as Dawkins puts it in his book, The Selfish Gene. If that were so, the conditional logic necessary for life to be possible would have to be found in the genome. Now, I am a computer programmer, amongst other things, as well as being a biologist. If you look for all of those if-then-else clauses in a computer program, you will not find them anywhere in your genomes. No one has ever found a program of life or a blueprint in a genome. And we've been looking for over 20 years at complete genome sequences. There are switches in genomes, absolutely so, many of them. But those switches are controlled by other physiological processes that form the control routines that enable choice to happen. Those routines depend on the protein channels packed into the fats, the lipid membranes. They are conditional on-off um, switches, and they therefore can form part of a choice process. Furthermore, those membranes and their proteins are influenced by the electrical and chemical processes that only membranous systems can display and be sensitive to. Without those membrane processes, there could not be choice between different behavioral options. Choice, obviously, don't need a philosopher to tell you this, uh, is an essential element in any theory of variable free action. Not surprisingly, therefore, all our nerve cells, too have these controllable on-off switches. So do all the cells in our body. The possibility of systems that can make choices therefore arose when the first cells emerged with their membranes during the evolutionary process. That is where intelligence became possible in living systems. And what I mean by intelligence here is the ability to distinguish between and choose between behavioral options, just as artificial intelligence machines do. I'm not at this stage concerned with whether those choices are made consciously. I'm only showing that the intelligence of life therefore lies in our membranes and the variable processes that they enable, not in our genomes. Now, I haven't finished, because not only is water a remarkable liquid solvent, it freezes in an unusual way. Ice is lighter than liquid water. The molecules become further apart in, in, in ice compared to the liquid form, so it floats on our lakes and seas. All other possible solvents do the reverse. You won't find another solvent in the universe that can do what water does. Their frozen forms would sink. That fact is why we don't expect to find living organisms, certainly not of the kind we know here on Earth, independent of water elsewhere in the universe. Moreover, since ice floats, large expanses of water in lakes and seas remain open to living systems. They continue to flourish even beneath the ice. The ice even acts as a heat barrier because it's uh, a good insulator. And we think, that is, biologists think, 
That is why life on Earth survived the long periods, very long indeed, when the Earth was like an ice ball. Life as we know it may therefore exist elsewhere in the solar system on planets or moons that are completely iced over. Now, so far, none of the properties of water I've highlighted, which are very unusual, can alone justify my argument that living organisms can have free choice. But there is another property of water which does form a key fact in the argument, and it was first observed in 1827 by a scientist called Robert Brown. He ground up pollen grains to form even smaller particles, pollen dust, if you like. He then sprinkled that fine dust into water under a microscope. And as he watched under the microscope and watched the dust particles, they were all jiggling around, hardly ever stationary. Nearly a century later, in 1905, in one of his classic papers, Albert Einstein showed that the movements of the dust particles were due to their continual buffeting by the incessant movement of the water molecules. Now, I want this point I want to make two very important points. The first is that this is not true of solid machines like computers. The atoms in silicon and metal structures may be vibrating, but they are not freely engaging in the fabulous stochasticity we observe in a water-based environment. The suspended particles can travel over unlimited distances, many times greater than the diameter of the particles. Atoms and molecules in solids do not do that. In living systems, they're doing it all the time. You can watch it. You label fluorescence um, you know, fluorescently uh, any chemical in a living cell, and you'll find it travels all the way around the cell. The second point is that all the molecules and structures in our living cells are dissolved or suspended in water. All, including the genome, will be subject to the buffeting that Robert Brown observed and which we now call Brownian motion. And these facts form a fundamental difference between living organisms like us and determinate computer programs. Does it matter? You bet it does. For wherever we look in our studies of living systems, we find massive, random, stochastic activity. There is no way in which living cells could be exempt from Brownian motion. And importantly, that is also true of our genomes. The DNA threads must also experience these chance buffeting since they also exist in a water-based environment. Now, I want to pause at this stage in the argument to make a very important distinction. The fact that biological molecules and the structures they form are subject to chemical stochasticity is not disputed by anyone. Neo-Darwinists, particularly Neo-Darwinist determinists, like Jerry Coyne, for example, would accept that fact just as strongly as I do. What then is the difference between us? Neo-Darwinists actually enthusiastically embrace stochasticity. The random mutations in our genomes form an essential part of their theory of life. According to them, living organisms experience this stochasticity, but that is all that they can possibly do with it. The result is that we are subject during the evolutionary process to what they call blind chance. We cannot possibly help experiencing blind chance. And as organisms, we have to wait for the exceedingly slow process of natural selection to arrive at the very few random changes in DNA that can be beneficial instead of being deleterious. Importantly, they argue that during our lifetimes, none of those blind chance events can be used in any functional way. As a consequence, there can be no physiological basis for free choice based on molecular level stochasticity. And that is why neo-Darwinists like Jerry Coyne in Chicago conclude that free choice is just a magnificent illusion. The sentence in which he does this is so magnificent that I have to quote it. The illusion, he writes, 
of agency is so powerful that even strong incompatibilities like myself, he means himself, of course, not me, um, will always act as though we had choices, even though we don't, we know that we don't. We have no choice in the matter. But, he goes on, we can at least ponder why evolution might have bequeathed us such a powerful illusion. <laughs> now, notice the striking contradiction. Who is this we that can ponder why? Because from Coyne's viewpoint, why are we even capable of doing that and to choose either to agree or disagree with his statement? But look, I will leave that contradiction to one side. I can't deal with everything in a single talk to the IAI. Because I want to explain... To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.